So a large part of my job as being the verbal Naropedia for the world is clearing up misconceptions. And this is fine. It's a great way for me to impart knowledge to people, answer lingering questions, and make anime generally easier to comprehend. I shouldn't have said Naropedia. I covered literally all anime. But Naruto is the subject of today's video, specifically a character from Naruto and the group that he belongs to. For some reason, people have begun to ask me questions about a character from Naruto called Chiriku. And Chiriku was a member of the 12 Guardians. Mostly people ask me if Chiriku proves the existence of a god in Naruto, and if this god is omnipotent, and what the religion is, and who Chiriku was, and what are the 12 Guardians that he belonged to. And we'll get to all of those questions in a second, but before we get there, let's go ahead ahead and like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And if you want to be a monk for the Weeb Alliance, go ahead and hit that join button and join the Weeb Alliance over here on YouTube. You'll be getting three additional videos from me a month on top of cool badges, emotes, and member shoutouts at the end of every video. So when I say the name Chiriku, there's a solid possibility the majority of this people have legitimately no idea who I'm talking about. And honestly, that's fair. Chiriku is a manga canon character, though he doesn't play a large role. He's essentially brought up in periphery to to Asuma and ties into Hidon and Kakuzo's story of hunting down people with high bounties on their heads from the criminal underworld, most specifically the 12 Guardians. So before we actually talk about Chiriku, we should probably talk about what the 12 Guardians are in order to help you understand why Chiriku had a bounty on his head in the first place. In its most basal nature, the 12 Guardians are the bodyguards of the daimyo in the country they reside in. We don't know if other countries have a 12 Guardians force, so for the purpose of this video, they just protect the Fire Lord Daimyo. Each of these 12 Guardians wears a waist cloth with the symbol of fire on their waist. This is why Asuma has that little cloth hanging at the bottom of his vest. It shows that he is one of the 12 Guardians assigned to protecting the Fire Lord Daimyo. But how do you get assigned to this group? Why wasn't Asuma with the Fire Daimyo? And who else besides Asuma was in this group? Essentially, the 12 Guardians were 12 ninjas picked from all corners of the Land of Fire to specifically protect the Daimyo. He didn't have to be from Konoha. In fact, Asuma was one of the very few from Konoha. And the only mission of the 12 Guardians is to protect the Daimyo with their lives. The first canonical time we see the 12 Guardians introduced is during Itachi Shinden Book of Bright Light. I mean, chronologically, because obviously the manga did it first. But in this light novel, we see two of the Guardians escorting the Daimyo on his trip to Konoha from where he lived. These two guardians are paralyzed by Obito, who's trying to abduct the daimyo, but Kakashi and Itachi swoop in to protect the daimyo against Obito. So not the best showing for them out the gate. And their second showing isn't necessarily a great one either. Technically, their second showing was from a filler arc. So while this may not be canon lore, it does technically give us knowledge and insight into something that we don't know that much about. I tend to take these situations as helpful little tidbits that may point us in the direction of the truth. It's like how Tenshi, Kaguya's wife, is technically non-canon, but how did Kaguya have those kids? There's times where filler is useful and informative, and this is one of those times. In the anime, two years after the Ninetales attack, Kazuma, one of the 12 Guardians, figured he didn't like the status quo of Konoha. Well, technically that's an oversimplification. Essentially, Kazuma took his want to protect the Land of Fire to a radical extreme. He believed the status quo of the world was too delicate and thought that all of Konoha's resources were wasted considering they were a largely passive country. I mean, think about it. Essentially, 90% of the military force of the Land of Fire exists in Konoha, and Konoha never got into unnecessary battles. I mean, at this point, the Third Great Shinobi World War had been over for, what, five or so years? And Konoha wasn't looking to get into another war. So Kazuma's plan was to unite the entirety of the Land of Fire under one leader, the Fire Daimyo. And this makes a lot of sense. His entire job is protecting the Fire Daimyo. Therefore, it would make sense that he thinks he's the one person who should be in charge. And to a certain degree, the Fire Daimyo is the one person in charge. I'll better explain the political system of the Hokage and the Daimyo one day. But essentially, the Fire Daimyo is the president and the Hokage is the governor. So Kazuma's plan was to unite the 12 Guardians, at least as many of them as he could get, in order to overthrow the Hokage and then unite the Land of Fire under the Daimyo and thus spreading out the military forces of the Land of Fire to all corners of the Land of Fire. And apparently because Cosmo was a big time planner, he decided to begin to plan for after he destroyed Konoha and spread out these military forces to continue to spread the military forces to other countries and take them over with the military might of the Land of Fire. However, when the Fire Daimyo caught wind of this plan because they did not run it past him, he got the six 
Sykes' 12 Guardians who weren't involved in this plan to fight against the six who were. And these six loyal 12 Guardian members included Chiriku and Asuma and four other anime-only 12 Guardians. When these two groups of six came into battle with each other, Asuma and Chiriku were said to be the only survivors. However, Kazuma also survived and ran off and went into hiding. And would you believe it or not, this kind of made the whole team disband. Having all of your members kill each other is a good reason to break up the band. So after this battle only left three of the original 12 Guardians standing, Ending, the entire corporation was scrapped. They didn't refill their ranks or anything like that. It was just, yeah, we don't need them anymore. The Ambu already shadowed the Daimyo anywhere he went, and regular Jonin could be tasked with escorting the Daimyo on a mission basis. They didn't need a set force to escort the Daimyo around, especially when there could be other more important things that these very powerful ninjas could be doing, like dying to Hidan and Kakuzo. Why were Chiriku and Asuma both killed by Hidan and Kakuzo? Well, that's because because even though the 12 Guardians disbanded, they still held heavy bounties in criminal circles. This is because they were notoriously good people who were connected to a very high political figure. All members of the 12 Guardians had to be outstanding ninjas before they even joined the group. Outstanding ninjas of high moral resolve. It's a bit like the Secret Service. If you have even one thing wrong on your permanent record, you cannot protect the most important person in your country. So every member of the 12 Guardians had to be A, a very good person, and B, had to have conquered a lot of evil in their time as a ninja. And doing both of those things catches you a real bad rap amongst criminals and missing ninjas and in the black market. So even though unfortunately the majority of those bounties could never be collected on because they all killed each other, Asuma and Chiriku were very much alive. Oh, by the way, the 12 Guardians were eventually reformed because Shikamaru got invited to join them, but he rejected the offer saying that he'd rather stay in Konoha and protect his friends as opposed to the Daimyo. But that was anime only and technically serves no purpose from an information standpoint. But a war between the 12 Guardians explains why we only ever see Asuma and Chiriku, because they were the only people to survive. I'll use whatever non-canon information I want to, it's my page. And Kakuzo was very obsessed with money. Kakuzo was referred to as the treasurer of the Akatsuki. He would forget people he killed if they weren't worth a lot of money. He would refuse to do tasks if there was nothing to gain from it monetarily. So when he found out about two ninja who he could definitely kill, he wanted to kill them and trade them in for their bounties. And obviously the assassination of powerful and morally just ninjas would help the Akatsuki's cause. So the Akatsuki sent Kakuzo and Hidan to eliminate these high bounty criminals. Well, criminals from the point of the Akatsuki. And that is how we get to Chiriku. Chiriku happened to be the first of the targets that Kakuzo and Hidan went after. So let's talk about him. Who was he? What were his abilities? And how did he get them? Well, let's first not act like for even a second that Chiriko is not a blatant ripoff of Netero from Hunter x Hunter. Chiriko is a ninja monk from the Fire Temple. They're meant to loosely represent Shaolin monks from the real world, Buddhist monks who train in combat. And Buddhism is gonna be a pretty heavy undertone here. After the 12 Guardians disbanded, Chiriku was made the head monk of the Fire Temple, which made sense because he was the most powerful monk there. But where did Chiriko's power come from? Was it God? Was it ninjutsu training? And that's a good question. Let's get into it. Chiriko grew up in the Fire Temple and was trained by Chukaku, the previous head of the Fire Temple. Chiriko had a very advanced knowledge of chakra and barrier ninjutsu, specifically in sealing formulas. In fact, his abilities were so incredible that Kabuto tried to reincarnate him. However, Kabuto couldn't find his body. Probably because Kakuzo took his body to his bounty guy, and then his bounty guy brought his body to whoever put the bounty on his head. But while training at the Fire Temple, he gained mastery of the Fire Temple's ultimate technique, welcoming approach Thousand Armed Murder. The name seems kind of contradictory to me, but who am I to judge? In using this ability, he's able to overpower Hidan and Kakuzo simultaneously for a little bit. Essentially, the ability works exactly like Netero's ability. By entering a prayer stance, he can have chakra arms of the Thousand Armed God behind him swing and attack for him. It's a bit like a Susano as well, I guess. Except it doesn't provide any defensive measures. The only defense is these hands. Now this jutsu is a direct homage to a Buddhist god. And ironically, it's not the only jutsu that it's a direct homage to a Buddhist god. I'm gonna have to read this name out and I'm going to mess it up, so please leave me alone. But this is a direct homage to the thousand arm god Avalo oh. Avalokitesrava. Avalokitesrava? Avalokitesrava? 
Shravara. Avalokiti Shravara. One of those. This god is the Buddhist god of compassion, hence the welcoming approach, but is most popularly depicted with a thousand arms and three faces. Obviously, Hashirama's true thousand hands, you know, the big wood circle that is literally just a carving of this god with a thousand hands, is also a homage to this god. But the difference between Hashirama's and Jiriko's is one is made of chakra and one is made of wood. So what is the existence of this jutsu mean? Does it imply the existence of Buddhist gods? Is it definitive proof that those who pray get blessed by gods that exist in the Naruto universe? And if so, why don't we see more people doing that? Well, I most likely wouldn't go that far. While there is a literal ton of Buddhist symbology all throughout Naruto, that's mostly just because Kishimoto himself likes Buddhism. Buddhism has a very deep ingrained history in Japan, and Kishimoto uses a lot of Japanese historical figures in order to flesh out his story. There's just as much Buddhist ideology as there is Shinto ideology, which is Japanese ancient folklore religion, a bit like ancient Greek mythology. So I would just as soon admit that Buddha exists in the Naruto universe as I would, let's say, Izanagi or Izanami or Amaterasu, all of which are Shinto gods. More likely than not, this was just an ninjutsu, similar to the Susano, yet not as strong, and similar to Hashirama's True Thousand Hands, just not physical. Also, you would think that if this was the true blessing of a god, it would be able to beat Hidan and Kakuzo. I mean, sure, they're mostly immortal, but then again, so shouldn't the candidate of a god? Fortunately, this wasn't Chiriku's only ability. Like I said earlier, he was also very talented in Fu and Jutsu, which he and several other monks Monks used to attempt to suppress Sora's chakra. Sora being the filler character who was a pseudo Jinchuriki of Karama. Yeah, I don't know why they did that either. And oh yeah, I'm just now remembering that Hidan and Kakuzo actually didn't go looking for Chiriku. They went to the Fire Temple assuming that Jinchuriki would be there because it was a point of religion and actually just happened to bump into Chiriku who was attempting to protect the Fire Temple from them. And then Kakuzo was like, oh yeah, you look familiar and took his body to the Bounty Collector. And that's it. That's everything we know about Naruto's strongest holy person. He's just kind of a combination of Netero, Hashirama, and any Susano user. But that doesn't mean his ability is not incredibly cool and worth talking about. So if you guys enjoyed learning about this relatively side character in Naruto and also about a really cool kind of underground organization in the 12 Guardians, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And if you want to become one of my 12 Guardians, go ahead and hit that join button, become a member of the Weeb Alliance over here on YouTube. I'm not saying it's dumb to mark the people responsible for protecting the most important person in the land with a little fire sash, but you wouldn't take the back of a Secret Service member and say, follow me if you want to find the president.